and uh, real-time noise complaints so that are happening around us. But what are some of the dangers of this? Because of these smart city expos, and you have Microsoft and Oracle and the big um, IT companies, and you have the major transport companies of the world, and these mayors of the largest cities of the world all gathering and talking how they can make life more efficient, um, it all relies on 24-7 data collection. That's what it relies on. It relies on millions of sensors spread across the city, sensing different things. And you may say, well, that's kind of cool, and this is nice, and that's really helpful. But the aggregate impact is to turn a smart city into a surveillance city. That's where this goes. So smart city dangers. Let's just look at some of these smart city dangers. So um, the smart city infrastructure is essentially the skeleton of a surveillance state if it's misused. When the city's CCTV cameras, public transport scanners, payment systems, and even waste bins are all feeding data into a central database, it creates a data-rich environment. When that's combined with your digital ID, it can be used to track every movement, every transaction, everything you do within that smart city. And the integration of a personal phone-based digital ID, which has been rolled out in Britain, for instance, with smart city IT magnifies this problem. Then you have continuous movement tracking. When you have dense um, facial recognition camera systems scattered all the way through the city, the authorities can just lock into you and track you wherever you go through the day. So I have some drones at home. And um, I was in Toronto a few weeks ago, and um, you can't buy certain drones in America right now, but you can buy them in Toronto. So I came back with a bunch of drones. <laughs> And Christmas is coming up, as you know. And, uh, so I came back with a bunch of drones because you can't buy certain drones in America right now because of our dispute with China, but you can buy them in Toronto. So um, with these drones, they're quite remarkable. Um, you can hover these drones um, like 300 feet in the air and, it will, and you can program it to lock in on your face. And wherever you walk, that drone will just follow you around and just follow you through the crowd. And it just, just locks into you. And, and it will send a data feed to whoever's watching the data. And you can't escape those drones. The drones will have thermal imaging, and they'll have night vision, and they'll have just regular optics. And so these things are quite remarkable. I think my mother-in-law must be watching me sometimes <laughs> um, because she seems to know what I'm doing. But the, the, this drone technology really is incredible. But with facial recognition and linking it to a digital ID, in a smart, cist, smart city, simply walking down the street would ping various sensors so you're always visible to the system. You have no privacy left anymore. And so you then have geofencing and travel restrictions. So location data enables the government to do what they call geofencing, that is automatically enforcing ge geographical location rules on individual citizens. So for instance, if certain zones of the city are, are deemed off, off limits to high-risk individuals, the system can alert the authorities that you're coming close to the limits of the off-limit area, or they can disable your access. So for instance, you could lose access to public transport, your vehicle could be shut off, or your finite credit cards could just stop working when you come within a certain geographical zone within a city. And we, we saw, we mentioned it this morning, during the pandemic, um, China rolled out a vaccination app that was abused to control movement. Protesters found that their green vaccination status turned to red, and they were told to get off buses and public transport by the conductors because the conductors knew this person is refused entry to this certain area. So those digital IDs became digital handcuffs for those Chinese citizens just in the last couple of years. This example demonstrates how a public health app can be used to squash public dissent to government policy. A, a citywide digital, digital ID system would likewise be weaponized to restrict movement of certain people by zone or by time. And then you have purchasing power compliance. Why pay over? I've already covered that. Purchasing power tied to compliance. This is what we call a social credit score. You've heard of social credit scores? These are very real. If a digital currency is linked to your digital ID, then what you are allowed to purchase is programmed by the government. Digital currencies are programmable currencies. 
The government can determine what you can spend on, where you can spend it, and how often you can spend it. With these digital currencies that are being rolled out around the world, and over 150 governments are actively rolling out digital currencies as we speak here tonight. The governments can determine, for instance, in a smart city, if they want to preserve the environment, they may say that you can use 10% of your digital currency outside your 15-minute zone each month. Well, what does that mean? It means you can never travel. Your, your, your money is only good for a certain geographical zone. They can also say with, with programmable currency, that as in Europe, they literally have this restriction that with a digital euro, you're only allowed so many euros in your account at any one time. So if it costs 4,000 euros to live in a month, but you're only allowed to save 3,000 at any one time in your bank, it means you're a slave to the system. You can never build up wealth outside of the system to live on because you can never have more than three weeks supply of financial reserves in your bank account. Um, if the government decides that they need you to start spending money um, to, to stimulate the economy, they can start taxing or putting negative interest rate on your savings. When I lived in, in, in Cyprus in 2000, and when was it? 2005, 2006, the Greek government was going through a, a financial crisis and on the instructions of the European Central Bank, we all woke up one morning and found that there'd been a haircut given that night. You know what a haircut is? It's where the government just takes five or 10% of all your current accounts, balances overnight, and it's just gone. There's nothing you can do about it. And so I had a haircut when I was in, 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 in Cyprus because I was banking with the, the, the National Bank of Greece at the time. So these things are very real. And when you get on a government watch list, it's very hard to get off a government watch list. As a general rule in America, if you go on a no-fly list, there is no judicial procedure to get off the no-fly list. And once you get put on certain lists, it's very, very hard to get off those lists. So you may say, well, we don't have that in America just yet. But the key is in the question, just yet. Because we do have a social credit scheme, and it's informal, we've just lived through it for the last 10 years, it's known as cancel culture. And had anybody here in the state of Michigan posted, um, maybe you still do it today, if you post, if you're an employee of the state of, of Maine, if you post on social media and say, I believe that marriage is only between a biological male and a biological female, see how long you keep your job for the state of Maine. So we do have a social, a social credit system. It's not as formal as it is in China, but it's there nonetheless. So um, then you have the monitoring or censoring of online speech. And so once you have a digital ID linked to your SIM card, as in Thailand today, um, all internet logins can be tied to, the, your, to your digital ID. It means that every tweet, every post, anything you post on social media is tied to a verified identity. This will lead to online censorship of speech. And in Britain, we're seeing this happen in real time right now. Last year, um, there was um, um, a local citizen. Um, he, was, uh, he came from a refugee or immigrant family, and he decided to take out his anger on society by, um, by knifing to death a bunch of young girls at a ballet class. And it was a brutal killing. And there was an immediate upsurge of public anger because in that city, the governments have been importing many men from the Middle East and other parts of the world who view the local women as prey. And the government wouldn't do anything about it. To complain about this is racist. So there was an immediate upsurge of public outcry and anybody who was caught saying, let's meet in the public square at four o'clock this afternoon, the government was using um, AI and it was tracking down every British citizen that was calling for protests. And many of them are have now facing long prison sentences. Wow. This is happening even now in Britain. Uh, you know, in Britain uh, just recently, um, a woman was imprisoned because again, in the law, it's, it's against the law to protest within I think, 100 yards of an abortion clinic. And so she was standing about 50 yards away from an abortion clinic silently. And the police asked her, what are you doing? And she said, I'm thinking. <laughs> they said, well, what are you thinking about? She said, well, I'm actually praying in my head. And for that, she now is in prison with a multi-year prison sentence for the crime of thinking or praying in her head. So when President Trump goes to Britain just a few months ago, he starts complaining, you are shutting down free speech in this country. 
So the monitoring or censoring of online speech is spreading in different parts of the world. You then have resource restrictions for electricity, gas and water. This brings the prospect of rationing and automated enforcement. So if the, if the city declares an energy emergency, an integrated AI system might automatically restrict your home's thermostat or simply cut power after you've used your quota of energy. And how much power you're allowed is tied to whether you are a compliant citizen or whether you are a dissident citizen. Then you have conditional access to in a, in, a, in a connected system, skipping a mandated health appointment or vaccine now flags your status in the city systems. We saw this all across the EU when they rolled out um, vaccine passports. And if you, didn't, if you weren't up to date on your vaccine passports, uh, no vaccine, no digital pass, no entry to restaurants and no entry to travel. It happened in Europe just two, three years ago. And what they did in Europe, they explicitly said, this is a model for what can be rolled out worldwide. The, these digital IDs and conditional access based on your healthcare. Then you have employment opportunities and conditional access to employment based on AI profiling. What does this mean? Employers might use social risk scores drawn from your integrated data. If AI analyzes your data trail online and finds you to be high risk, you'll be quietly filtered out of job shortlists. And this kind of algorithmic discrimination would occur without your knowledge. In fact, um, somebody raised a question about this with a British airline, and they said, how come all your um, stewards and stewardesses are young and fit? And they said, well, because you can't discriminate on you know, whether somebody is you know, tall or short or broad or thin, or you can't discriminate on those grounds. And the answer from the airline was, well, we don't look at them physi physiologically, we just take a look at what sports they're engaged in. Yes. And once we've developed a profile of your lifestyle, we can have a, that's a pretty good predictor of how you're going to look physically. And there's no law against discriminating on whether you do marathon running or not. But that's a good indicator of whether you are physically fit or not. And so the airline was using um, uh, profiling of individuals on uh, totally th things totally unrelated to whether you were going to be a good steward or stewardess or not um, to decide who was going to be serving in the airlines. And then you have the erosion of private privacy. Ultimately, if all devices and services feed data into the centralized systems tied to your digital ID, personal privacy as we know it is eroded. Every smart light bulb, every fitness tracker, every car sensor becomes a data point about your life accessible to some central authority. What this means is that your privacy evaporates. And you may say, well, what's the problem with that, Pastor Vine? The problem is when you know that you are under 24 seven digital surveillance, it profoundly affects your behavior. It affects your mental health. It affects how you treat other people. It affects who you're willing to meet because everything's being monitored. I used to live in the former Soviet Union and um, the, uh, in a place called Nakhchivan, which was an autonomous republic between Azerbaijan and Iran and Turkey and Armenia. And um, it, was a, it was a very small place. And I was there with two other workers for ADRA. They now live in Tennessee. And we were aware that the KGB, because that was still KGB back then, the Soviet secret police, we were aware that every email was read and every phone call was monitored. Our driver and our translator were both KGB. Nothing I did was unknown to the government authorities. Everything I did was known to the government. And does that change your behavior? Yes, it does. I used to send my mother because they'd have to translate all my emails. So I would send my mother in England via, we used to have CompuServe. Some of you remember CompuServe? Uh, we, the, the internet was so bad, I'd leave my computer on auto redial. On Friday afternoon, I'd leave the office and I'd try and send my mum a chapter of, of oh, I don't know, Patriarchs and Prophets. Hey, mum, I found a book. This looks really good. Take a look. What do you think? Knowing that some poor KGB officer has to read this and translate it. <laughs> I thought, you once read my emails, I'll give you emails to read. <laughs> so sometimes you turn it to your advantage. But I can tell you, um, I, I, I never, I used to say to my colleagues, don't worry about when you're under 24 7 surveillance. The locals know you're under 24 7 surveillance as well. Nobody's going to touch you or attack you or harm you or steal from you because the KGB have got two eyes on you every moment of time. 
So nobody's going to give you any trouble because everybody knows these are KGB guys right here. They're not just drivers and translators. These are KGB. And KGB are a law unto themselves. They can kill at will. So having 24-7 surveillance, I've lived under it, it is a... It changes how you behave. And we planted a church in that area. There was nothing, and we planted a church, and they were all Muslim background, and uh, we were busy doing this on the side. And uh, there, was a, there was a local doctor, and he was an Adventist, and uh, a wonderful man, and, um, but he was under 24-7 surveillance as well. And I remember going to visit with him, and we'd go for walks outside. We'd leave our phones at home. We'd go for walks out and along the, the city roads with cars whizzing by us, so nobody could hear the conversation. And he would talk about what it was like for him as a national to be interviewed by the KGB and what it was like for me to be interviewed by the, interviewed by the KGB. I could walk into a KGB interview knowing that I had a foreign passport. That's a whole lot different to walking into a KGB interview knowing that they can do what they want to you. And there is no law can stop them. And the pressure and the stress this precious brother in Christ was under, knowing that as the head elder of that local church plant that was growing rapidly among Muslims, he was under immense pressure from the government. And they knew everything about him. And they had what they call a papka. A papka is like a, a brown file. And everybody in the Soviet Union had a papka held by the secret police. And um, he said, if there's a mark on your papka, your kids don't go to university. They don't go to college. Um, the government will direct them into cleaning, cleaning out rats in the underground or something for your life work. But if you, if you stray outside what the KGB thinks is acceptable, then you and your family are marked forever. And so he said, just meeting with you is a threat. And so I... Um, what I realized out there was that the government was interested in young men, but they weren't so interested in grandmas becoming Christians. So we focused on ministry to grandmas because they can spread the faith in their homes. But the men were afraid to come to church because of the social consequences when you're living under 24-7 surveillance. So living under 24-7 living uh, surveillance from the KGB or living under surveillance in a smart city is kind of the same thing. It's more, to, in the, for a smart city, it's more like 1984 um, with George Orwell. Um, so in a sense, we all have to make decisions about smart cities. And are we going to move or live in a smart city or in a city that is going smart? Or are we going to follow another direction in life? Uh, that's a serious question. You know, I'm, uh, how many, sister? You don't know any? All right. This one tonight is smart. This one tonight, yeah, this is a smart city here.